on Tuesday, January 16th, and online classes will open January 15th for the uh, spring semester, so be aware of that. So don't forget, finish up strong. Do a great job this week. Have a great finals week next week, and then we're looking forward to a great spring semester. And now I'll give way to Mrs. Harper. Good morning. I have a couple of reminders for you or more information. Um, those of you who are quick on filling out your FAFSAs, it's not available for next year still. We're still waiting to hear. Um, it still says it'll open Decem by December 31st, so as soon as we know, we'll let you know. But the FAFSA, that's for next school year, the 24-25 year. So um, just watch for an email from us. Also, we'll be sending you probably this week or next week an email explaining some of that. So if your parents are hounding you, you can forward that email to them and let them know, you know you're just waiting, you're waiting to hear from us. So we'll send you a parent-friendly email that you can give to your parents about that. Um, and then also exit counseling. If any of you are graduating this semester or not returning for spring and you took loans, um, you will need to do ex financial aid exit counseling. So it's both of those. If you're not returning and you took loans. So if you didn't take loans, you don't need to do it. So um, send me an email to set up an appointment for that and we'll get you scheduled. Thanks. Good morning. <laughs> so Bridge the Gap Nursing Home Ministry is having one last visit for the semester. It'll be on sen Sunday, December 10th, and we will be giving Christmas presents to the residents and the staff, and we'll be praying with them and just spending some time with them. So if you're interested, I want to invite you to come along. It would be a really great time. Thank you. Morning, church. Look at this good-looking bunch coming out here. Wow, awesome. Hey, uh, I'm excited about worship today. Would you stand and let's, uh, let's begin our worship with a, with a word of prayer this morning. Father God in heaven, you are awesome and holy. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity we have to bring our worship and lay it before your throne. We thank you, Father, that as we do that, you accept that worship. And uh, we love you, Father, and we thank you for the opportunity to serve you. We pray that this moment, this time, we can set aside everything else that's going on in our lives and simply worship. We love you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Good morning, Central. Welcome to your last chapel of the semester. Congratulations. You have made it. Um, today we're going to sing a Christmas song. This is um, Joy to the World. So would you um, join us in worship this morning?
to spend this season celebrating the birth of your son. And thank you, Lord, that we get to gather here today. Lord, I pray that you'll be with our speaker, Clayton. May the words that he speaks be the words that you want him to say. And may our hearts and minds be open to your word today. Lord, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, it's great to see you all here for the last chapel. It's great to hear such uh, good worship reminding us of the reason for the season and the praise that the Lord deserves. I'm here today to introduce our speaker, but before I do that, I just have to thank you and the entire campus community for the great job done by hosting Bible Bowl over the weekend. We had uh, 300 students from 48 different uh, churches in 11 states who were here, their sponsors. Everything went off without a hitch. You guys were great. We heard great reviews from them. We had a student team lead worship. We had all kinds of staff members helping in great ways. Thank you for helping us host Bible Bowl Nationals, and uh, hopefully that won't be the last time they're here. I know they had a great uh, experience, and thank you for being part of that. Well, today's speaker comes to us from... Uh, Really the largest church in the region, uh, the crossing in Quincy, Illinois. No relation to the crossing in Columbia, if, if that's one that you're familiar with. The crossing in Quincy, Illinois is the home uh, to uh, 11 different locations where they have uh, a great church ministry around the tri-state area of uh, Missouri, Illinois, and Iowa. They also serve in, in prison, taking the crossing inside uh, to different prison populations in the region. Um, they have uh, about 5,000 that attend online, about 7,000 in person of the people at those different locations in those areas. And one of the things that the crossing has done great in our region is help towns that were otherwise struggling economically and with other different problems that they're facing to have hope and see that Christ and the church are, are the way that uh, transformation can come. And uh, our speaker today has uh, recently become the lead pastor of The Crossing, sharing that responsibility with Jerry Harris, who had done that for many years. Jerry's still in a role as teaching pastor as well. But Clayton Hinsell is, I think, in his second year in that role. Now, Clayton, um, as you can see, he's standing up over there ready to come. And I'm not, I'm not going to have to give him much of an introduction. As his friend said, a, a big guy doesn't need a big introduction. So I'm just going to keep it short. Clayton is a graduate of Ozark Christian College. He's been on our campus before to speak. And before then, I understand that he dominated a particular basketball game. He may tell you about that. I don't know. Um, he is not yet 40 years old, which makes him a, a great example of a good young leader who has got a wonderful future of taking a wonderful church uh, to even greater levels. I'm looking forward to what he has to share with us today. Would you join me in welcoming Clayton Hensel? Well, you're finishing up your semester, you're getting ready to go back home, and I don't know if you were like me, but when I was in Bible college, you get all this Bible college education, and then you have to go home to your home church with your mom and dad, and you have to be like, well, actually, that's not how it happened. Your parents will be talking about something in scripture, and you'll have to do the, well, actually, um, mom, I hate to break this to you, but this is how it actually went down. And there's probably no place in scripture that has been more abused by culture than the Christmas story. How many of you, your mom is gonna put some kind of cheap nativity uh, set together in your house? Oh yeah. Well, let's just spend a little bit of time giving you some material to make your mom mad, right? There's no better way for us to spend a little bit of time uh, here today, but before I get into that, I'd be remiss if I didn't say this one. I enjoyed my opportunity to uh, speak here before, and I'm thankful I got invited back. That doesn't usually happen for me, 
I'm more of like a one-hit wonder, and they're like, I don't, I don't know if we want to trust that guy with the microphone again. Second thing is, I have to give kudos to your president. Uh, Dr. Fincher's got to be one of the busiest guys in the movement. Uh, he is always making a deal somewhere, and we, I'm amazed at his energy level. If he worked for our church, we'd probably have 100 locations. Um, and my team would get upset if I didn't say this to you. Um, if you are looking for future employment in ministry, our church is always hiring. Uh, and you can, if you can figure out what is the thing that you are passionate about, more than likely we have an opening in the area where you are passionate. From kids to worship to counseling to camp to uh, being a pastor, discipleship, evangelism, outreach, you name it, we are constantly hiring for it. So if you are interested in having a job at some point, we would like to help uh, you and God answer that prayer. So if you want, you can go to thecrossing.net, you can find my face on the staff page, and you can say, I want to be employed. And we will do our part to help you navigate that journey. So let's build the nativity. It begins with a 70-mile journey to Bethlehem. We assume there was a donkey because of how far along Mary was in her pregnancy. But what happens sometimes is when you walk through the nativity scene, we see it all in the rearview mirror instead of the windshield. So let's slow the story down and let's actually see what it would be like if Jesus was coming into the world today. Fellas, those of you who are lucky enough to have a girlfriend for now, imagine saying, hey, sweetie, we're going to go on a little journey, and we're going to go 70 miles, you're pregnant, and we're going to walk. This is not the kind of date you'd want to go on. This is not the kind of conversation you want to have with a pregnant person. You don't know this, but when your mom was pregnant with you, she wasn't nice. <laughs> and on top of that, you have to tell her, we got a 70-mile walk slash donkey ride. Not exactly the beginning to a Hallmark movie. <laughs> Multiple nights. The venue. Where are we going to have this child? A barn. No hospital. No nurses. No doctor. No epidural. No bed that adjusts to your comfort. No pain pills. No pillows. No come serve me button. How many of you guys have had surgery? And they give you that little button and it rings the nurse and they come in and get you whatever you want. No button. Can you imagine the reaction of your wife, fellas? You make the 70 mile journey, you show up and there's no room. No room for what? Oh, no room for me to have the baby? No reservations? No call ahead? No connections? Nobody that you can lean into and say, hey, would you help me out? So this baby left heaven. He would have been slumming it if he was in the most pristine of palaces. But here, we find him, surrounded by a loving mother, a stepfather, and farm animals. I think of uh, Jesus in his teenage years, walking out of the house and forgetting to close the door. And Mary going, Jesus, were you born in a barn? And Jesus going, actually, I was. And then she goes, well, if your father had made reservations, and then Joseph and Mary get into an argument. <laughs> Baby Jesus is not placed in one of these oak three-door chests with clear plexiglass crib on top. Nope, we have the creator of the universe in a feeding trough. He's not surrounded by Walmart knickknacks, no Target decorations, no Babies Are Us, no shoot me in the face Ikea. We're talking farm and home. That's how we prepped for the king. You have Mary. Mary has the talk with Joseph. And the Bible records his response. Like imagine for just a second, if after chapel, after you have the meatloaf for lunch, 
Ladies, God comes to you and says, you are highly favored among, among women. And you are now pregnant with my baby. And you need to go tell your boyfriend, your fiance. Feel this. Feel the weight of what that moment must have been like. This is how Joseph responds. Because Joseph's husband was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Yeah, this relationship's going nowhere. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. To give you a clue of how bad Joseph takes it, it takes an angel of the Lord to come and appear to him to keep him from walking away. Pretty significant. Joseph then becomes resolved to carry out God's plan. Think about the Thanksgiving dinner before Christmas. Not that the Jews were celebrating Thanksgiving, but imagine if you would. And you're sitting there with your family, with your pregnant fiance. And your mom and dad are going, so you're still going to marry her? Yeah. The one who says she's pregnant? Yeah. With God's baby? <laughs> yeah. Like, would that go over any better today than it would have back then? I was telling our church this past weekend, Mary has more in common with a person who belongs in a mental institution than she does with somebody who's highly favored. Imagine trying to get people on board with your problem. My problem is I'm carrying a baby that's God's. Yeah, I'm still a virgin, guys. I promise. If anybody came to your dorm room, sat on your bunk, had this conversation with you, would you be going, this sounds wonderful. <laughs> and you're sitting there with your family, and you're going, hey, we're going to have to bring you uh, like, she's going to be one of us. She's taking our last name. Okay. All right. I just want to, to make sure. There's a little devotional thought. Jesus came into the world because a couple of people were willing to be obedient, embrace challenges, and be weird. And I think that's how Jesus comes into people's lives today. You make up your mind in advance to be obedient. You embrace the challenges. And you come across a little weird. So that the people around you that you love can experience Jesus. You have to pre-decide, pre-decide that you're going to be obedient. Because if you wait until the challenges come to start making up your mind... You'll be tempted to back out. But if you pre-decide, I'm following Jesus, fill in the blank, no matter what. Then when the no matter what, the fill in the blank shows up, you've already pre-decided, I'm going to live with the consequences. I'm going to do what God called me to do. And when you live a life like that, other people go, that's a little weird. But when you're a little bit weird, you get an opportunity to introduce the world to Jesus. The angels show up. Luke chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. But the angel said to them, so, uh, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Uh, two things to note here. They say uh, we have good news. We have gospel. I think sometimes we have forgotten that the message we proclaim is good news. It is not hate speech, but a powerful message of hope. And please do not let the world convince you that it is not good news. This is the message that was protected, exalted, and carried by martyrs. In your ministry lifetime, the gospel message will turn 2,000 years old. It's been good news for that long. 
And if you become convinced that the good news is no longer good news, it will stop with you because you'll stop sharing it. Maybe the reason we're not as evangelistic as we should be is we don't believe the gospel is as good news as it actually is. Because you wouldn't be nervous about sharing something that you believed to be good. You wouldn't be worried about talking to people about your faith if you believe that life with Jesus is better than life without him. Our inability to exalt the gospel message comes from the fact that we don't believe it's actually good for people. We don't actually believe that God's way is the best way. Because when you read the New Testament, you'll see people who are willing to do whatever it takes for every single person to hear it because they believed it was the best way to live. And then this is crazy. This good gospel message, this is going to blow you guys away. It's for everybody. Everyone. Let me walk you through. It's not just for the nice people. It's not just for fun people. It's not just for employed people, educated people, well-dressed people, church people, married people. Part of what makes the good news good news is that the good, it's good news for everyone. There is no pre-qualification. If you're a you, it's for you. But the frustrating part is that it means that it's good news for other people as well. The people you might not want to hear the good news. The people you might not want to come to faith. The people who've been mean to you, hurt you, walked out on you, abused you, bullied you, stole from you. Yeah. That's one of the things that's so frustrating about Jesus is he's even for our enemies. He's even for the people we don't like. Uh, you guys will have this problem at some point in time. You'll be going to church on a regular basis and you'll have to figure out like how often do I take communion? Because like we'll have three services on a weekend. Do I just have to just keep hammering grape juice like all the services? Like can I just take it once? But then if I don't take it during a particular service, are people going to think, why is Clayton not taking communion? Does he have something against somebody? And you're like, okay, well, I just don't want to worry about the people around me. I just want to. So here's what I do. Whichever service my wife comes to, I take communion. But I always take two communions. And it's not because I'm big and I need extra love or any grace from Jesus. It's because I pray four prayers. Uh, I take the first piece of communion bread and I go, thank you for dying on the cross and paying a price that I could never pay. That's my prayer. Because there is no way I'm getting into heaven <laughs> on my own. My second little piece of bread, I say, and thank you for not giving up on me, even though I deserve it. Because when I thought I was, when I was going to become a Christian, this is what I thought would happen. I was stupid, 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 sin, 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 found Jesus... Stop being stupid, stop sinning. But that has not been my story. Is that your story? That like you're still kind of a screw up? And I'll be honest with you, the sins I committed before Jesus don't haunt me nearly as much as the sins I've committed since I've known better. Since I've had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in my life. It's those sins that actually frustrate me the most. And if I was God, <laughs> I would smite me. I've done all of this for you, and this is still how you've behaved. He's had every reason to give up on me, and he hasn't. Then I take uh, my first uh, cup of juice, and I pray, uh, you know, this simple prayer. And help me to live a life in response to this grace and love. Because how can I say I've received it if I'm not changed by it? All right? Now, then I take the last cup of juice. And help me to remember that you didn't die for just me, but for the sins of the whole world. There are people I don't like. And I need to be constantly reminded that God sent his one and only son to die on the cross for more than me. That I am not the center of the gospel message. While it applies to the very center of who I am. God, 
And his love for all people includes people that I would exclude. The angels show up and they deliver a gospel message that is good news for all people. And if it wasn't for all people, it wouldn't be as good of news as it is. Then you have the shepherds. Dirty, smelly, isolated for months at a time. So untrustworthy that they weren't allowed to be witnesses in courts. They were looked down upon by the religious elites. Imagine Joseph, after a 70-mile journey, in a barn, right after Mary gave birth to a baby, placed him in a manger, as if right now their relationship is going perfect. And then he goes, the shepherds are here, sweetie. You mean the people we don't want to associate with? The people we don't want to be around? This is not the time to bring people over. The shepherds are here, hon. Luke chapter 2, verse 17 says, When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. The very first proclaimers of the gospel message were a bunch of guys that nobody else would have picked. There are some of you in here that maybe nobody would have picked you. Nobody would have picked you to be the worship leader, the camp director, the pastor, the preacher. Nobody would have picked you to be the one to go into full-time ministry. Nobody would have picked you to be the one to go to Bible college. But that is how our God works. He picks people that nobody else would pick so that way he gets all the glory. The wise men show up. Now, you, this is where you do the well actually with your mom. Well actually, mom, when they showed up, they were in a house. So we're going to need to get another set so that we can have two Marys and two Josephs in different stages of life. Matthew chapter 2 verse 11 says, On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, incense, and myrrh. In the future, you guys will be parents. And if your kids get greedy and you don't want to give them any more Christmas gifts, you can just say, you know, we're just doing three gifts this year. And you're like, Mom, Dad, why? I'm like, well, because Jesus only got three gifts and you're no Jesus. So you're getting one gift. <laughs> okay? It's just where it stops. We're having, a, we're having a real Christmas this year. You get three of them. Then my, if you're my kids, my kids will be like, so gold? That sounds great. How much? Uh, here's the interesting thing. The uh, wise men show up and they worship Jesus. Have you ever wondered why? Like, I know why you worship Jesus. Because of everything he's done. Like, if you come up with the list of all the reasons why you would worship Jesus, you'd be like, well, he died on the cross for my sins. He rose from the dead. He gave me the power of the Holy Spirit. If you were one of the apostles, why are you worshiping Jesus? We walked on water. He calmed the storm. He fed the 5,000. Fed the 4,000. Healed the demoniac. The guy who was paralyzed. The guy with the shriveled hand. The guy who couldn't see. Well, we did all of those things. You should have heard the Sermon on the Mount. This guy can preach. Of course they worshiped him. But what about the wise men? Why were they worshiping? We have spent so much of our lives worshiping Jesus because of what he's done. But the wise men are worshiping before all of that. The wise men are worshiping Jesus because of who he is. Our worship sometimes increases and decreases based on how much we feel like God's been doing his part. When you finally get a girlfriend, woo, Jehovah Jireh, you're a provider. You break up, you're like, where are you, God? Here I am alone. Just kill me now. We spend our time elevating our worship when we get the right thing out of the vending machine of our spirituality. 
and then we're a little bit more reserved when the bag of chips didn't exactly fall out the way we had hoped. And so we come into our worship bringing our expectation of his provision of our desires. And then we go, because of what you've done, then I'll give you the kind of worship that you deserve. The wise men show up in a completely different state. He hasn't done anything yet. They are worshiping him for who he is. This is Old Testament worship. This is the Alpha and the Omega. This is the one who spoke the universe into existence. He was there in the beginning. Through him, all things have been made and are held together. All things are for his purposes and according to his purposes. The wise men show up and they are worshiping Jesus, not because of what he's done, but because of who he is. He is God made flesh. I wonder what would change in your worship if you were to just delete all the things that he's done and just recognize him for who he is. Then your worship would not be contingent on your mood. Your worship would not be contingent upon your circumstances. Your worship would be contingent upon something else. It would be contingent on who he is, and he's never not God, and gods are never not worthy of worship. Then you have the dragon. Anybody's nativity have a dragon? Okay, so, I mean, you guys, I mean are your parents even believers? <laughs> right? Revelation chapter 12, 1 through 5. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all nations with an iron scepter. And the child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Don't miss this. Satan was there, and he was after that baby, and he is after you. Satan takes no days off. It's not long after the birth that Mary and Joseph have to flee for Egypt to escape the execution of all boys two years and younger. Satan, the accuser, was out to kill Jesus and destroy you. The good news is this baby doesn't stay a baby. 33 years later. He climbs on a cross, and he defeats Satan once and for all. You have Jesus, baby Jesus in the manger. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. The virgin will, give, will be with child, and she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. John tells us that he tabernacled, he pitched his tent, he moved into the neighborhood. That's what makes this God so special, is because he knows what you feel. He knows your hurts. He knows your pain. He knows your sorrow. He knows what it's like to be tired and hungry and frustrated and disappointed and to come from a split home. He knows what it's like to be heartbroken. There's never a time when you have talked to God about a pain that you are experiencing that he hasn't been able to say to you, I know. I've been there. But Jesus, my closest friends have said mean things about me. And Jesus is like, yeah, I know. Jesus, listen, the people that I was depending on walked out on me. Jesus is like, well, yeah, I know. Jesus, I have enemies. And I've done nothing wrong. And Jesus is like, well, yeah, I know. Jesus, I'm being tempted in a way that I didn't think I was ever going to be tempted before. And Jesus is like, yeah, I know. Except I navigated my temptation after 40 days of fasting. I was in such bad states that angels had to come and minister to me to put me back together to finish my ministry. So tell me about your problem again. 
Whatever you are navigating, I've navigated. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Here we get this unique insight, brings the Old Testament back into the center of the picture. He gets the name God is salvation, the Lord's salvation. It's pointing us back to Joshua of the Old Testament, who is bringing people into the promised land. God is nonstop pulling out a highlighter in the Old Testament and then drawing a big arrow to Jesus in the New Testament. Hey, you guys tired of living in the desert of your sin? You guys tired of the barren nature of your life? You tired of working hard all day, no fruit? Hey, guys, check this out. On the other side of this river, there's a promised land where everything that you've been toiling for and searching for is already provided for. Jesus is constantly leading us, not just towards intimacy with him, not just towards the indwelling of his Holy Spirit, but to the ultimate, ultimate promised land of heaven. Right now, our world is having an incredibly hard time reconciling the teachings of Jesus with the lives of his followers. They are looking at the biblical text and people almost universally are huge fans of Jesus. They're just not huge fans of the people who say they love him. When you look at this biblical narrative and you see all the characters that show up, they all sacrificed. They all had to put something up in order to be a part of bringing Jesus into the world. And what we want is we want Jesus to come into the world. We want the credit for doing it without actually having to participate and sacrifice and make choices that point people to Jesus. We know the scripture says, pray for those who persecute you, love your enemies, but we would rather do something different. Can I memorize the verse instead of make the verse real? Is that a fair trade, Jesus? Look at Joseph. I just told our church this past weekend. There's this line in the middle of the narrative where it says that Joseph abstained from having sex with Mary until she had the child. Joseph, more than likely, a really good virgin Jew. Looking forward to his wedding day, just like every other Christian. Finds out she's pregnant and has to go, so how long are you going to be pregnant for? Like, do babies come in like three days? Because we have a honeymoon schedule. He goes, okay, for nine months, I'm going to forego my right. He put his sexual urges on the altar to bring Jesus into the world in an unscathed way. He took something that was important to him and he said, okay, I'm going to forego that. It's a tough question for us Christians today. What's the thing that you've actually sacrificed? What's the thing you've actually put on the altar? What's the thing that you've actually done differently than the world other than your schedule? What's the way that you've actually handled conversations, actually handled conflict, actually navigated sacrifice that's actually brought Jesus into the world? If you were wanting to summarize the entire Old Testament, all of the weird books, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, what you'll see happen, dietary restrictions, clothing restrictions, holiday uh, restrictions, all those things were designed for God to carve out a people that would be so different from all the people around them that they would go those are the people of God and then God would dump so much blessing on this group of people that intentionally chose to be significantly different than everybody else that the other people would take notice and desire what they had and you'd think that that's just what the play he ran in the Old Testament no. He runs the exact same play in the New Testament. In the Sermon on the Mount, 
He says things like, you've heard it said, but I tell you. Other people lord their leadership over others. Not so with you. We're going to be people who serve. He goes, let me give you some imagery. Let me show you something that makes it look a little bit different. Um, I want you guys to be a city on a hill. You can't hide. I want it to be a light on the stand. I want you to stand out. I am carving out a group of people that will be different. People that love their enemies. Because it's not hard to hate your enemies. Everybody can do that. In fact, I'm going to carve out a group of people. And I'm going to make the expectations, the qualifications so high, you can't do it. That it requires the Holy Spirit at work in your life to make it a reality. That God, if the life you're calling me to live, I can't live on my own. And he goes, that's kind of the point. What will separate you from the world around you is you can live the life that they're living on their own. But what I'm calling you to is so uncommon, so impossible, that it will require God inside of you to pull it off. Why is he doing it? Because he wants you and I to live so differently, look so differently, behave so differently, that he can pour out his blessing on us and the world around us will go, I want that. That's different. I've had enough of what I've been having long enough. I want what I see happening in them. What God did was, is he sent Jesus to walk the same roads that they walked, have the same jobs that they had, live in the same environments that they lived, but to do it so differently that people took notice. And his plan for you is the same. That you would sit in class just like everybody else. Go to McDonald's or wherever else you go to eat, like everybody else, but there'd be something different about you, about how you spend your money, about how you navigate sexuality, about how you deal with temptation, about how you deal with people who wrong you. There'd be something so different that other people would take notice. And that is how God brings Jesus into the world of the people he's trying to reach. His expectation was that Jesus would be him in the flesh. And Jesus' expectation of you is that we, corporately, would be the body of Christ. Jesus, incarnate in our communities. And let me tell you why this is so important. Right now, you know somebody who is struggling with a porn addiction, but they don't know how to tell anybody. Right now, there's probably somebody in this room who's struggling with sexual intimacy and they're going more and more resentful and distant and frustrated. Right now, you guys know couples that are too busy living a surface level life. They're being honest about the dark thoughts that plague their mind. Right now, you are gonna go and minister to middle-class families that are navigating immense financial pressure and they are wondering if the stress or their financial stress will destroy not just their dreams, but their present realities. Right now, there are parents who are getting ready to sign divorce papers, and their kids are about to go through the darkest of valleys. Right now, there are addicts who are overcome by their addiction, and they don't know where to turn. Right now, there are addicts who just broke a sobriety streak, and the shame and frustration is making them want to give it up altogether. Right now, there are people in your circle of friends, one in 11 people, are having suicidal thoughts. They're thinking about ending it all. Right now, there are men and women of all classes and generational labels who don't have the energy or the will to get out of bed and face the day. Right now, there are kids in your communities without running water, heat, or air conditioning. When they go to school, they're excited that at least they'll get fed today and they'll be safe for a couple of hours. But their poverty is a lightning rod for being bullied. And so they have full stomachs, but empty hearts. Right now, there is a girl that you know, but you don't know that she's cutting and self-harming. She's one of those long sleeves in summer girls, and nobody thought to ask. Right now, most of you probably know a young girl who is empty on the inside, and she's getting ready to cross boundaries sexually to find love and acceptance, only for it to rename her, 
redefine her and abandon her. Right now, you are interacting with rich people who have everything from the outside, but they are empty on the inside, and they are trying to figure out if this is all that life has to offer. And while to everybody else it looks like everything is fine, on the inside they are broken, and the image that they are keeping keeps them from being honest and real and asking questions. Right now, you have a friend, a family member, a coworker who is going through a diagnosis, and they don't know how to answer the questions that keep rattling around in their mind. And they need answers to those questions. They need Jesus in those situations and in those circumstances. They need somebody who's been carved out, somebody who's been set apart, somebody who's been made holy, somebody who's willing to be obedient, deal with the consequences and come across a little bit weird. So it rattles them and goes, I need what you have. And they don't need this next year. They don't need this next month. They don't need this next week. They need this now. And they need it from me and they need it from you. They need somebody who's been transformed by the gospel message and be willing to have the beautiful feet that brings it to them. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for loving us, for never giving up on us. God, help us to be changed and transformed by the work that you have done on our behalf. And God, help us to remember that you didn't die for just us, but for the sins of the whole world. In your name I pray. Would you stand? Let's worship one more time together today. king of love had given up his life the darkest day in history there on a cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood atoned one final breath in But not the end we could have thought For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn What sacrifice was made As the heavens rose
let's show our appreciation to Clayton for coming over today and sharing with us. You know, there, there were a lot of quotes that I wrote down, filled up about a page, but this was the one that stood out to me. God picks people no one else would pick, so God gets all the glory. And, uh, you know, nothing personal about any of us. God has no obligation to pick anybody. And the ones that we think might be picked, he doesn't have to pick them either, but he chooses us so that we can serve him. You know, I'm, I'm glad Clayton didn't talk about his uh, triple-double that he had on this floor back when he was a ball player. But that sermon was a triple-double, okay? It was easy to listen to, it was biblical, but it was personally challenging. And I hope that you took those things with you from what he shared. And uh, if you're interested in uh, the crossing, you just need to know the kind of church it is has the same heartbeat as that message. It's a church that's focused on making sure that people can come to know the Lord understand the scripture, find a way to serve him, find healing and salvation from their lost life and come to a new place. And if that's the kind of church you want to be part of, I would urge you to talk to Clayton and his team that's here today. They would love to hear uh, from you. We'll be having lunch uh, in the Pioneer Room just for fellowship afterwards. But if you're interested in uh, Some place here in the Midwest, Kirksville, Hannibal, Quincy, Jacksonville, Macomb, and half a dozen other places. Feel free to come in and uh, say, say hello and, and get to know them. All right, I've got a few announcements that I need to make. And uh, because it's the last chapel, this is the last chance we've got to do it. And the uh, first thing that I want to share is that um, after chapel today, you'll get an email that has some details about our uh, changes in some cost structure for next year. And we're mentioning that to you now so that you have plenty of time. This is not for the January semester. It's for the fall 2024, uh, spring 2025 year. And the reason we need to put that out now is because we're already recruiting students for next year that are looking for estimates on their costs and making those decisions. And we want you to have that same kind of information that we give our prospective students uh, that, are, that are thinking about coming here. And it's going to change a little bit, not drastically, but I'd it's going to change enough that you need to understand it. So I wanted to explain a little bit of that now, and then you'll get an email with some explanations that can give you some next steps if you have more questions. Probably the largest change that you'll notice is that starting next year, we're going to split room and board as two separate charges so that you can um, see not only how much the room and, and, and the, the food costs, but so that you can have some choices in the matter. So uh, we'll have three different meal plans, uh, a full meal plan, a, a reduced meal plan at 10 per week, and one at five per week. This gives you some chance to, to tweak your, uh, your meal uh, your meal uh, routine based on your work schedule or based on the days that you're here, things like that. It'll also let you save some money if uh, you're not eating all the meals all the days, and that's going to start next fall. We're looking forward to providing that as an option and keeping more and comparing with what other colleges do. It gives us the freedom for our prospective students and for you to, to pick a meal plan that fits you. It also lets us prepare for the fact that we'll have some apartments available next year, and some people may want a few meals while they're living in the apartments. This will be a good system for us to do that with. Another change for next year is with the textbooks. For several years, the cost of textbooks have been fit into the overall student fee costs, and we've just covered the cost of the textbooks at a rental level, then giving you the chance to buy them. In other words, you were paying for textbook rental even if you bought all of your books yourself. And that's going to change starting next year. Instead of that system, uh, you'll be responsible to get the books for yourself, and there will be multiple ways that can uh, be done, and it may be on a course-by-course -course basis. Some courses may have digital textbooks, which will be even less expensive than the print ones. Some courses, you may want to rent the book, and the bookstore will have that available, or you, you may want to buy the book to keep. And it just depends on the class and depends on the book itself. So that's a change for next year that you'll see on the, uh, on the uh, information. And then there's just some slight changes in, in some of the fees. I think the tuition is going up a little bit. The semester fees are coming down a little bit. Um, all that will be on there. And it will be posted on our website in the next few weeks as well. That's being emailed to you by the end of the, uh, of the uh, morning. And, and you'll be able to see that. And our financial aid department would love a chance to talk to you more about that if you have any questions. Or you can talk to Mr. Ammon or or Mr. Lindsay, and they can help you uh, with that as well. All right, one more announcement I've got to make before I hand it over to someone else. Every year, the uh, 
The good folks at the Next Gen Preacher Search out of Pepperdine University look for young people that are wanting to be uh, next generation of preachers and teachers. And they do a contest where uh, students from the ages of, I think, 18 to 23 can apply and be part of that. And they screen all those applicants down and pick the top 20 to bring to California for a couple of days of training and to compete to be a finalist. Uh, we've had people do this in the past. Some have uh, uh, been finalists and some have even become ambassadors. Uh, the most recent one is uh, one, of, one of our own students, Elijah Odell, did that a couple of years ago. Well, this year we are thrilled to announce that two of our students were chosen to be finalists. And in fact, it's the only two here that applied. I urged them to apply. They were in my uh, class and they did it. I'm not sure whether they thought they would make it or they were just doing it to be nice to me. But they did it, and they were chosen to be two of the top 20. And those two students are Faith Stout and Nene Owen. Where are you? Stand up wherever you're at. Faith Stout and Nene Owen. There's Nene. Faith is there. So in February, they'll get a couple days off of school to go to the beaches of Malibu in California. And I promise they'll be learning some things while they're there as well. And they'll get to learn how to become better speakers. And uh, we're so excited for them and wish them the best. So uh, good job for them. And now I want to let Janelle Owen come and introduce you to the newest member of our team and tell you a little bit about her. So Janelle Owen will close us out. Awesome. Hey, Clayton, thank you for a great message today. And just re being reminded uh, of the good news. A couple of things I took away, I didn't put it down in my notes, but one of them was I'm not taking near enough communion. I feel like <laughs> I feel like I'm about a court low on a Sunday morning and I need to be going back and hitting that two times. Um, <laughs> that and then and then the good news just being the good news. My I don't know if anybody's on TikTok. I have a bit of an eclectic feed on TikTok, but uh, one of the guys that I follow, this guy named Dan McClellan, and he is a PhD in theology and religion, and um, and I just can't stand hardly about anything that guy says because it's so confusing. I don't know how to make good videos. I want to make videos to stitch, I think is what you do on TikTok, you stitch things. Uh, and uh, and the, thing, the thing that he said last night, though, he's, he was, he was um, letting everyone know, well, really, it's a bad translation deal in, in Hebrew. They mistranslated being born of a virgin of the verse back in, in, in Isaiah. And, and really, most people understand that, that Matthew and Luke's nativity story was actually added much later, that a lot of religions have a virgin birth narrative, and that that, that was, was kind of extra stuff. And I'm just like, what? That's... There's no way, and, and I'm getting into the comment section, and I'm just scrolling down through here, and all of these people that are just like deconstructing, you know, like, oh, maybe the good news isn't really that good news. And I just thought, gosh, like, sometimes you think the battle is just on a Sunday morning, and you're going to get up and do something amazing on a Sunday morning. And I'm just telling you, like, all over, right on your phone is a pulpit, and, right, and there are people that are just lost and they're getting turned sideways by people that look like Jesus people that are not they're just not Jesus people and and so there's so much opportunity to tell the good news and today you got a great message on that and it just encouraged me I'm super pumped uh, by that to hear that and just like yes this is the truth this is the good stuff um Speaking of the good stuff, I'm so excited. One of the things that I get to do here at Central is, is get to oversee the athletic program of what we're, what we're doing there. And we've just been trying to bring a lot of things back uh, to Central. And you got to see Chase not too many chapels ago. Uh, we're doing soccer. And today I wanted to introduce you to Kelly Cobb. Uh, Kelly's dad used to coach basketball here years ago. So she kind of grew up, yes, uh, grew up kind of running around on the bleachers here, and she comes home. Uh, she's always had a passion for volleyball, was around it and, and participated with it in college, uh, and then has been coaching the last couple of years in, in Hallsville uh, at their high school. And so if you are someone that, and I know many people have been petitioning, can we get girls volleyball back? Uh, we have it back. Uh, let's go, right? Let's go. Um, 
But just like soccer, you know, you, you, when you're trying to recruit a whole team, man, that's a lot. And, and soccer is really tough because you got to get 10, 12, 14 guys in, right? And the same thing with girls, we need five, six, seven, eight, right, to, to have that. So we need some help from the campus. If you love volleyball and you've been playing on a, on a Sunday night and you've been doing that, if you think that I think I could do that. Like, I would love to do that. I love the game, and we're gonna, it's going to be a lot of fun um, and, and a great way to rep Central and, and a great way for us to fill stands and, and to be able to celebrate, celebrate some fun stuff on the court. If you would be willing to consider, like, playing next year after Chapel, Kelly's going to make herself available. If you would just talk to her and say, hey, I don't know if I'm any good or not, but I think I'd really like to play. Like, that kind of energy, that's the kind of energy – uh, that we need. Kelly will make herself available. She'll be here on campus uh, all day today uh, for the most part. And so whether you see her right after chapel or at lunch, if you would take a chance to introduce yourself to her and let her know that you might be willing to do that, that would be, that would be awesome. All right. Any, any other announcements? All right. You are dismissed. Thank you.